enough to understand the process right from when the gene uh, is uh, turned into messenger RNA, right to we get our final finished protein. Because the questions I will ask you, and your understanding, should be all of this material. It shouldn't just be sort of like just little bits and pieces. You have to put all of what you know for biology together uh, in order to, uh, to talk about biology. It's kind of interesting that biology at this day and age is all about the... Um, uh, the, the biochemistry, really, the biomagnetism. Like gone past the point where we're talking about, you know, general things like, you know, what does this animal eat? What's this, uh, how does this, how quickly does this sort of thing grow to the point where what we need to know in biology is on the level of macromolecules. Are we on? Yes. Okay, all right, so we were talking about translation. And, uh, Translation is the process by which the messenger RNA actually produces a protein molecule. So, and a protein molecule, of course, is just simply a large polypeptide. So, in the process of translation, we have a messenger RNA. It's already been processed, like we talked about before, and now we're actually going to get a sequence of poly uh, amino acids in a row that makes a polypeptide. Um, translation occurs in three steps. Okay, so. Initiation, and I believe this initiation is where we left off last time. What does initiation look like? Initiation involves the binding of a small uh, ribosomal subunit to the messenger RNA, and there is a section of the RNA that is the messenger RNA that is specifically for ribosomal binding. It's not the start codon, it's the sections where the messenger RNA that's just where the ribosome binds, and the small subunit of the ribosome is the first thing that binds to the messenger RNA. Um, this section of the messenger RNA that's coding for ribosomal subunit binding is part of the gene. So, just like we talked about last time, you can't consider the gene as something that's simply just telling you what the protein's going to look like and what the sequence of amino acids is going to look like. The gene has a lot of different parts to it. It has promoter regions, it has control regions, and in our particular case, it has regions that help it open up and say it needs to be translated, regions that encourage it to be translated, regions that control its, uh, its sorry, encourage to be transcribed, regions that control its transcription, um, and it has actual coding regions. And we even talked about even in the coding regions, it's broken up by regions that don't code, the extrons, they don't code for anything. The introns, sorry, don't code for anything. And they're there. So the gene is this complex structure with many different parts to it. Yes? What tells, um, the, in, like, I think you mentioned earlier how, like, um, the part that needs to be coded will, like, bend, and, like, it's only that part that's open. Well, a, a gene, remember, is a section of a DNA molecule that goes on and on and on for, for, for hundreds or even thousands of base pairs, depending on the organism, depending on what it's for. Uh, there's a section at the beginning of that that lets the cell, the cell machinery know, the nuclear machinery know that this is the beginning of a gene and this might be some important information that's downstream from here. Downstream means further along that can be read. Is that what your question is asking? So then like, uh, what tells, or how does, like, what signals that this part... It's going to be read? Yeah. Lots of different signals. It could be a hormone has been received on the surface of the cell, triggers changes in the cell, and that message gets sent to the nucleus and says, unravel this and begin to do this information. It could be something in the environment that gets into your body, into your interstitial fluid or into your bloodstream, and it goes to the cell and says, you need to unravel the section of DNA and begin to uh, make this protein. So there's lots of different signals. It could just be the right time in the cell's development cycle. Uh, it needs this protein to get to the next step of its development, to become more complex, to divide, to die, whatever it is. That's the, that signal comes from the cell itself as part of its life cycle, that that section of uh, DNA needs to be uh, transcribed. Okay, so lots of different signals, including some from the environment, uh, in indicate that a section of DNA needs to be transcribed. Okay? So that DNA is opened up, it's transcribed, about 10 base pairs are exposed at a time, and various polymerases come on, particularly RNA polymerase in our case, um, and it reads the DNA. In other words, it facilitates the making of a messenger RNA molecule that is a copy with base pairing. So it's kind of a 
rear copy, a base pairing of that section of DNA. Okay? The section of DNA that is read is the 3' prime to 5' prime strand of the DNA, and the messenger RNA that may, complementary to it, runs 5' prime to 3'. Prime. So the messenger RNA is made 5' prime to 3' prime, and it itself is read 5' prime to 3' prime by the ribosomal apparatus. The DNA itself is 3' prime to 5' prime because it's what makes the RNA and it's the RNA is made backwards on the DNA. So it's made in the opposite direction. Okay? All right, so here we are with the initiation step. The small subunit binds. Uh, somewhere downstream of the binding, and it, I, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna put it a little further along, but it really doesn't matter too much where you put it. Somewhere downstream of the binding will be your initiation codon, and that's three base pairs that are gonna tell the ribosomal machinery, here's where we're gonna start. Um, and the large subunit binds, and the large subunit may be a couple times bigger than the small subunit. So we're going to call that the large subunit. It binds and then slides its way down to the initiation codon. And almost every organism that we know, the initiation codon reads A, U, G. Almost. And almost every organism, it's one of those things that's only universal to life on this planet. A, U, G is the start codon for just about everything. Just about. Just yes. about. If you go back to the start of life, have a look around, let me know, come back and tell me. I would appreciate it. Give me a couple of you. Yeah. Okay. One of the, the ideas is that all life originated from a single cell. And that cell used A and G. And then that genetic code has been preserved through all lineages that come from it. So this is one argument for the fact that as complex as life on this planet is, it originated once. All the life we see originated once. Could well be that their other lives originated and they got gobbled up. Right? Bacteria really didn't eat anything in front of them. Right? So it could be that life originated many times and got gobbled up. But the life we see seems to have originated once because this code is universal. The tiniest microbe to the biggest blue whale all use A, U, G as the start codon, which suggests that they all came from the same place. Because it could have been any of the codons. All right, so where the two ribosomal subunits have bound, and then our first transfer RNA shows up, so that's part of initiation as well. We talked about the transfer RNA. It has this clover leaf structure. At the bottom of the transfer RNA, the cloverleaf structure will be an anticodon that matches the start codon. So in the long sequence of bases that makes up the transfer RNA, you have the codon that matches the anticodon here. And so to match, A pairs with U. U pairs with G pairs with C. C. So this first transfer RNA is going to read UAC in the direction where we're reading now. Those of you who are really clever will realize that it actually doesn't read UAC. What does it read? CAU, because it must be going in the other direction. All right, so this is our transfer RNA. It's coming in, and this first transfer RNA bears what? Formal methionine. Amino acid, and we're going to just say it's methionine. So there's an amino acid, and it happens to be the first one, which is methionine. Got a modified methionine, formulated methionine, but we'll just worry about it being methionine. Okay. And that's going to come in, and it's going to match this codon. So the first thing we have is that this first transfer RNA ends up right here matching the codon. Is get into the camera. That's two of your eight teachers in one video. 
is there three A's? It's hooked up, it's matched. Now, the large subunit, the large subunit and the small subunit are acting as one now. They move along to that uh, initial codon or that initial codon antipodon pairing is in your P site on your ribosome. So we're going to break the ribosome down now a little bit. So this is kind of like a quick and dirty diagram of the ribosome, and we're going to have an A site, I believe it's a P site and an E site. Does that match what you got? Okay, so let's get a dark marker here. Thank you. So you've got an A site that we're going to use in just a minute when we get to elongation, and a P site. The action happens at the P site. This is where, where, where the, the real key stuff happens. Here. So Please all learn. along this ribosome, complete ribosomal uh, complex, the P site is the key. The initiation process is going to happen right here at the P site. So right there at the P site, <coughs> codon, anticodon matching. Right? Now it's ready to put its first amino acid in place. It's not attached to anything, but the first amino acid's there. So on top of that P site, you're going to get that transfer RNA that we've been talking about. And it's got its first amino acid there ready to go, and it's there in the P site. Okay? That's your initiation step. You got your first amino transfer RNA with its first amino acid in there at the P site. You got the ribosomal subunits together. Now we're ready to make protein. Yes. If at the P site uh, and methionine is the first amino acid there, how does it stay in place? Why doesn't it just... It remains go? there until the next one arrives. Is there like some sort of force that's like Not attracting force. it? force. This is all done with chemical with covalent bonding, actually. So this amino acid is covalently bonded to the transfer RNA. It's a chemical bond. It's just attached. Okay. Right? So the next amino acid... through an oxygen and the right oxygen amino acid. Okay? Boom. It's attached to it. It remains there until the next one arrives. Um, both the, the both the TRNA. The TRNA oh. and the amino acid remain there until the next one arrives. Yes. Okay, good. So our next step is the elongation. What's happening in elongation? Well, elongation is the part of this process that takes the longest, and it's the actual making of the polypeptide. The new transfer RNA charged with an amino acid, loaded, charged with an amino acid, arrives at the A site. The one that arrived just before is still sitting at the <coughs> P site. In this case, it would be the but it would be whatever. So we've got a transfer RNA here. And it's got the previous amino acid sitting there. When this one arrives, there's a process by which this transfer RNA gets ratcheted along to this site and a bond is formed between the incoming amino acid and the previous amino acid. Note that this bond is forming at some distance from these sites. These sites are really where about the binding of the transfer RNA to the messenger RNA. Then there's the transfer RNA molecule, and at the end of the transfer RNA molecule is the amino acid. So there was some confusion before about the codons and the amino acids. The amino acids aren't touching the codons. The amino acids aren't touching the codons. They're removed from the codons by that transfer RNA molecule. So, so kind of like the feet of the transfer RNA molecule are matching the messenger RNA, and then it has in its hand above its head the amino acid. So it goes to the next site. Right? The, it's from the E site, sorry, the A site to the P site, and the amino acids are there, and the amino acids are being joined at some distance from the reading of the code. Question. The ribosome is moving, and the transfer RNAs are staying on the same piece of messenger RNA. That's correct. What's been just pointed out is when you have your messenger RNA, 
that same blue marker again. Have a random second codon. So this is our first codon. There will be an anticodon right here. For this one, and it'll be attached to an amino acid at some distance. And then the next anticodon will be here. What will this anticodon be? G. I can't see. Gak. And there we go. And it's attached to its amino acid. So these pairings are still, and the ribosome ratchets itself along. So when it arrives at the A site, it's because the A site's here. And a, uh, and a fraction of a second later, the A site will be down at the next codon. You're right. So the transfer RNAs match the messenger RNA. And once they match, that's it. They're there until they've given up their burden and they float off. Okay? And is the ribosome that ratchets its way down, spinning a GTP every time it moves along. So it moves to the next codon, it cleaves a GTP to get the energy to do that, and now it's the next codon. It cleaves a GTP to do that, gets the next one. So it ratchets itself along the molecule, spinning GTP to do it. Question? Is it moving down this way? It is moving 5 prime to 3 prime along the molecule. So it began at the 5 prime end, and it is headed towards the 3 prime end. Yes? What's the advantage of using GTP versus using ATP in this process? There probably is a good one. And I'm not sure. Something about the configuration. Where it's needed, what enzyme it has to attach to, makes it the choice. Yes? What does the title transferase bind? Excellent. When the new... It's... Uh, don't think of it as, as pictures, it's continuous, right? It don't th like you think you're thinking of like snapshot, 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 which is what we do to explain it, but it's continuous. So it acts sometime in this process of the new transfer RNA coming in and moving to the P site. So that by the time this transfer RNA moves to the E site and is ejected, a bond has formed between the amino acid at the P site and the one it used to hold. So it's kind of, as they're coming in, they're coming into the one site, it's kind of grabbing them, locking them together. By the time it's left, that bond is formed and that amino acid chain is, is, is uh, beginning to, is floating free, beginning to uh, be born, nascent amino acid chain. All right, so I'm going to hand out some questions. All right. Okay. So this is the elongation step. A new amino acid arrives at the A site. Uh, sorry, a new transfer RNA arrives at the A site carrying an amino acid. A bond is formed between the arriving amino acid and the uh, last amino acid brought in. The amino acids move along to the next site. So they arrive at the A site. From the A site, they move to the P site. By the time the transfer RNA gets to the E site, its, its amino acid has been attached to the one at the P site, and it is free to leave. So the transfer RNA, having given up its amino acid, moves off into the site. Not complete, right? So incoming at the A site. The P site is your action site. That's where we say peptidyl transferase acts, but it's really acting in the incoming molecule. And we have this new amino acid chain that's grown from everything that's gone through. The P site has added a new amino acid to the chain. Right? By the time the transfer RNA gets to the E site, it's ejected from the ribosomal complex and out off it goes into the cytosol. We're in amino acid transferase, we'll add a new amino acid to it and make it available for work again. Questions about the elongation step? Yes? Into the cytosol. Yes? Absolutely. Transfer RNAs are absolutely specific to the amino acids they carry. So you need a different transfer RNA for every amino acid. In fact, you need a different transfer RNA for every possible codon. We need a different transfer RNA for every possible codon. We talked about this last time. So a codon is a three-base code. 
How many possible bases are there for this first position? Four. Four possible bases. It can be A, G, T, or U. Or sorry, A, T, U, or C. Okay, so there are four possible bases in the first position. How many possible bases are there in the second position? Four. four. Same four again. How many possible in the third position? Four. four. What is four times four times four? Sixty-four, isn't it? Sixty-four. Sixty-four. So there are sixty-four possible codons. So your cell will need, almost need, 64 possible transfer RNAs. No, it doesn't need quite 64. Three. Three for the stop codons. 61. Why? Three for the stop codons. Ah, three of these codes say stop. So it doesn't need a transfer RNA. There is no amino acid for the stop codon. But it needs 61 different transfer RNAs. The cell has a little trick. Some cells have a little trick to get away with fewer. But most of your cells, your cells in particular, we in this room, we have 61 different transfer RNAs. One for each possibility, leaving out the possibilities that say, no, stop, give me a transfer RNA to stop. At this point, just stop making growth. Question. Don't do it. There's a couple hands up. Yes. There must be 61 different tRNAs, but only 20 amino acids. I go 20 like that, because not every organism is the same, 20, but 20 amino acids. So there's 61 different transfer RNAs. For 20 different For 20 different amino acids. What does that tell you about transfer RNAs? They the same acid. There must be more than one coding for the same amino acid. For that reason, it's called a redundant code. Redundant, it means it repeats. Right, if I say, by the way, it's a nice day outside. Hey, look, it's a nice day outside. I'm being redundant. I'm repeating the same information. So the transfer RNAs are redundant. Some of them have the same information, the same amino acid, but they're there because the code can vary. Okay. And once again, some cells have a little trick. They don't need quite the 61, but most cells do. They have all 61 because there's 61 different possible codes. Right? Combinations of three letters, and they've got a different one to specify the 20 amino acids. So some amino acids are specified in more than one transfer RNA. And there are two amino acids that only have one transfer RNA. If you look at your code, you can see which ones those are. Why don't you do that now? Look at your code and see which amino acids only have one transfer RNA. We don't know. Thionine is the first, right? Thionine is going to be UAG. One more. We'll let you do that. Um, no, sorry, it's not possible. Um, Pepsi. 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 In, in the termination step, we're going to end the making of the polypeptide chain. So right here at the peak, we always have an incoming transfer RNA. And that transfer RNA will have the last amino acid added. And attached to it will be all the other amino acids that have been brought in by the transfer RNA over the course of making the polypeptide. So it could be hundreds. Right? So it could be hundreds strung out from this last transfer RNA at the P site. Because the elongation can literally happen for hundreds of reiterations. Okay? So they're all sitting there strung out. Long chain of amino acids. For the termination step, we arrive at a codon that doesn't say, doesn't code for a transfer RNA. Instead, it is a stop codon, stop codon and it codes, it's attracted to a termination factor. factor. I think we call it termination factor or release factor here. Termination factor. Release factor. factor. Code a release factor? Yeah. Okay. Can I say both? So, at the A site arrives as the ribosome slides down the molecule, this codon comes into the reading frame for the A site. What codon would that be? Give me one of the termination. Pardon? U-U-A. It's like U-U-A. U-A-A. 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 Yeah, U-A-A. So the U-A-A codon arrives at the A site. So instead of coding for a transfer RNA, 
There is no transfer RNA that codes for UAA, that has the anticodon for UAA. doesn't exist. What does exist, however, is a release factor, and that release factor has the anticodon for UAA. What will the release factor's anticodon be? A. Okay. So there will be a, a, a release factor, and we'll just draw a different looking molecule. Okay. It arrives, base pairs with the stop codon, and now there's no new transfer RNA arriving at this site. That means this protein chain cannot elongate. So this catalyzes the end of the protein synthesis step, or the end of the uh, of elongation of the uh, polypeptide chain. It is exactly like the blockade. So this blocks the site. No more transfer RNA can come in. They would match anyway. Now the ribosome ratchets down, and all of a sudden the release factor of the P site finishes it because the new amino acid was always being um, attached to the P site. So when the termination factor reaches the P site, everything disbands. When the termination factor reaches the P site, the last amino acid is released. Okay. They just tap a phosphorylin uh, on it, and away it goes. The last amino acid is released when the termination factor gets to the P site. It releases the amino acid chain. Cuts the tether, and off it goes. Put your a string of helium balloons, helium balloons. and the release factor is a scissors. <laughs> another balloon. And it gets there, and click. And now the string of helium balloons load off. Sad little Jiro has a lot of memories like that. <laughs> yes. So when the release factor gets um, binded into the A site, it also cleaves off the It moves along, and that process of moving along, it has activity at this end that acts as a, and has enzymatic activity at this end that helps cleave off that last amino acid from the transfer RNA. Sorry. It moves into, it moves into the P site, it cleaves off the Yes, that's right. Cleaves and, and releases the polypeptide chain. Then the ribosomal subunits dissociate. Sorry? <laughs> Associates. They all go their separate ways. So when, after the binding of the release factor, the important steps are release of the polypeptide chain. Ribosomal subunits dissociate. The release factor itself dissociates. And photosynthesis is now finished. So the key thing is the EA termination. Binding of the release factor, release of the polypeptide chain, and dissociation of the ribosomal subunits. They're like this because they, they've flown apart. And that releases the messenger RNA molecule as well, too, because they've gone off the messenger RNA molecule. So it's released as well, too. The messenger RNA is released. Now, what happens to the messenger RNA? It can be broken down. The cell may only want one copy of this protein. It could be reread. It can be go through the process again. In fact, it could be already be going through this process. Multiple ribosomes can bind to a single messenger RNA. For the large messenger RNAs, a ribosome will bind, start transcribing and making, uh, start translating, sorry, and making protein chains, and then right behind it, another one will jump onto the ribosomal binding and slide along. What do you call a string of ribosomes thus connected? Yes? Polysome. Seven. So the, you can have the uh, several messenger RNAs, or several ribosomes along a messenger RNA. It's really neat. You can actually see this in electron microfilm. You see this. Guys, we're taking a video over here. And an electron microgram. You see this, okay? Now, what? Who? Which end is the five prime? And which end is the three prime of the messenger RNA that I have just drawn this electron microgram of? Five prime is what the shortest is. Five prime, three prime, or three prime, five prime? We don't know.
wherever the shortest it is. So this is an electron micrograph of the poly salt, so I'm asking you to figure it out. Yeah. So if it's shorter. Oh, three is on the longer side. Three is the one with the longer. Three here? Yeah. Why? Because the three side, or the three prime side is further along than the five prime side. This would have to be the uh, hepti heptidal chains. It's a great test question, right? Like, why is the oh, poly salt? Which side is which? <laughs> well, the thing is being read from 5 prime to 3 prime. So this ribosome here has already read all of this. This ribosome has only read this. So the polypeptide chains are of different lengths depending on how long the ribosomes had on the molecule. Mm. Yes? It's being read 5 prime to 3 prime. It's being read five prime to three prime. So this is the beginning, and this is the end. So when it gets to the end, the termination sequence, this is the long polypeptide chain that's being produced. So this is the, this is where the biology is. You have to think your way through. Your five looks like three. That's right. So this would have to be the five prime end of this polysome. Also find ribosomes associated with the surface of the rough ER. So we also see in the plasma reticula, which are essentially tubes, and we see ribosomes at the surface. What can you imagine is happening with a ribosome studded on the surface of the endoplasmic reticula? What do you think might be going on there? Translation. Either translation or it's creating. It's called rough ER. It's got ribosomes on it. Now you already know that ribosomes just don't stick around, right? So wherever there's a rough ER and a ribosome stuck on it, that ribosome's there for a reason. Hmm. What do you think is going on? Yes, David. Translation is pro uh, sorry. Translation is probably going on. And what kind of translation? Why? Why on the? Why would the cell bother to put the ribosome right on the surface of the ER? Because inside is the actual yes. mRNA. Part, um, so the tRNA can exit the cytoplasmic. No, tRNA is all here in the cytoplasm. Hmm. What do you think it might be doing if the protein is so made? Oh, it's what does the ER do? It's packaging. It packages it. Yeah, yeah it's it packaging. wants that protein just go inside, inside, inside the ER for some reason. Mm. It's dangerous. It's going to be exported. Something. It wants that protein inside. So you put the ribosome right on the surface. So as the protein is made, it can go right into the endoplasmic reticulum and onto the next step. Maybe it's going to the Golgi body. Maybe it's going to be excreted. It's neat. And maybe it's just dangerous to have that protein inside the cell. And so right away, that protein is put right in the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, so a lipid-lined vessel, and it's off to its next stage of life. So uh, you, that's, a, that's a good hypothesis as to why the ribosome would be on the surface of the endoplasmic reticulum, where the protein is, can be inside, can be made and go right inside, so floating around and having to find its way out of the cell. And it's all, the cell wants to be very careful about where some proteins are. And it could be a protein that's simply for export. Or like I told you last time, it could be a protein that's really dangerous. Suppose the cell is making a toxin, mm. right? Like it's a, it's, a, it's a cell lining the, the gland of a pit viper. So it's making a nerve toxin. Does it want that floating around in its own body? Well, no. It's going to put it right into the endoplasmic reticulum and on its way out to go stick it into you. So, uh, <laughs> <what's going on? laughs> Stay away from pit vipers now. All right, and that's our termination step. All right, so that brings us to our end of our protein, our, of our translation step. Our protein is not ready for use, but getting our protein ready for use is our next story. Protein pathway.